Please turn to the 37th Psalm. We have open Psalm 37. We're spending our Sunday mornings looking at a selection from the book of Psalms. And today we come to this well-known psalm, this very much loved psalm. And we've never studied it before uh, together, not at least in the last dozen or so years. And we can call it God's word to his people in a materialistic age. So our subject is Psalm 37, which is God's word to his people in a materialistic age. And we start by looking at a common temptation. Look at verse 1. Fret not thyself because of evildoers. Now look at verse 7. Halfway through. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. So we start by looking at a common temptation. Here is the temptation which all of you who are Christians experience. It's the temptation to fret. Three times we read it in those three verses, 1, 7 and 8. Fret not. But what does that mean? Well, here we are, we look around the world and we see a world full of men and women who really don't care a straw for God. They don't care a straw for the word and the law of God. The majority of our neighbours fit into that category, perhaps the majority of our relatives. We live in a world where the philosophy of most people is me first. And because they think like that, me first, they engage in all sorts of dishonesty, they engage in all sorts of ungodliness, and yet while they're doing it, they prosper. How many times have you men been for a job, you've tried to please your God and do your best, and yet the job or the promotion went to somebody else who was unscrupulous, ungodly, swearing, non-caring, someone whose whole philosophy of life was me first, who cares nothing at all about God or his word, and what you most wanted for yourself, you wished to have that promotion, it went to somebody who really has no time at all for the things of the Lord. And how many times have you women, you've been in a situation where you felt you needed something, you needed it very badly. You felt you felt that you couldn't do without it. You felt that your family needed it. And yet you couldn't have it. And yet just down the road is somebody who's managed to afford and to have that very thing. And the somebody who's got it is somebody who doesn't care tuppence for the things of God. And you look around the world and people who don't care about the Lord seem to prosper. Everything seems to go their way. If I can use this expression, it looks as if the dice are loaded in their favour. And as if everything is prejudiced against the people of God. They don't seem to have the troubles we have, do they? They seem to be much more at ease than we are. And again and again we see ungodly people rising to positions of power and influence and we say to ourselves, wouldn't it be wonderful to see one of the Lord's people in that position? But instead it's one more ungodly person in a sphere of influence. Nothing seems to go wrong for them. They do what they like, to whom they like, when they like. We look round our schools, we look round our places of study, we look into the office, we look into the factory floor... We look amongst our own neighbours and friends, it seems to be the pattern everywhere that things are going quite well really for unconverted people and not very well really for us. And so we face this common temptation to fret, to get uptight about it. 
to be on edge, uneasy. And we're tempted to envy them. Sometimes we wish that we were in their shoes, even even if it was only every now and then. Well, we wouldn't mind being in their shoes sometimes. Everything's going for them, nothing's going for us. Sometimes our wicked hearts say to, the, say to themselves, is it worth being a Christian? I ask you, is it really worth it? Sometimes we get actually irritable, angry, because everything seems to be going for them so well. And we're giving in to that temptation. We're spending our lives now looking over our shoulders at the unconverted. It's not long before we've started taking a mental note. We know what clothes they wear, what carpets are on their floors, how they spend their weekends, where they go for their holidays, what they do with their money, what influence they're able to exercise. And before long we've fallen into the temptation. We're spending our lives looking over our shoulders all the time at how the unconverted world, of which we're not a part, is getting on. That is the common temptation which this psalm deals with. And the temptation to which we so often give in. And if you look at verse 1, you'll see that it is a temptation which we are categorically forbidden to submit to. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. It's a temptation which we're categorically forbidden to give in to. Look at verse 7. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger, forsake wrath, Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. You are forbidden to get uptight about the fact that things seem to be going very well for the ungodly. It's not to prey on your mind. It's not something about which we're to lose any sleep. It's not to be a dominating factor in our thoughts. We're not to spend our days looking over the shoulder at how the unconverted world is getting on. We're not to be jealous, even in the slightest way, of the unconverted. We're not to nurse discontent in our hearts. We're not to question that the godly life is worth it. We are categorically prohibited Fret not is as categorical as is thou shalt not commit adultery. God's word here is as clear as thou shalt not steal and thou shalt not kill. In fact, fret not is the same as the tenth commandment. Thou shalt not covet. We are never to compare ourselves like this with the unconverted. And yet I dare to say it that after the service, when you've had your roast at lunchtime, and you sit down and you feel nice and sleepy, and you think of the neighbours next door, they're just turning on their telly to watch what deep down perhaps you're a little sad about missing. And you've got to get up and get out and come to Bible class or Sunday school or get on, and even this very day, within three or four hours, the temptation will be there again to look over at the unconverted and saying, they don't half have it easy. Why don't we have it like that? And the temptation is there again. Tomorrow night, Monday, is the first day of your working week. You'll have your tea. It'll be time to come out then and pray with the Lord's people for the blessing of the great king upon his work. And yet your neighbours, they'll be sticking their feet up, their slippers are warm by the fire, panorama is on, or whatever it is. And the whole temptation is, well, why don't we have it like that? Why is there so much responsibility resting upon us? Why can't we have it as easy as they do? And they live as they please and everything, their life seems so comfortable. 
That common temptation, says the psalmist David, is to be totally resisted. So we're looking at a common temptation. Now before we proceed with the psalm, there's a second thing we must now do. We must learn from this psalm how to tell the wicked from the godly. The temptation is that the godly look over their shoulders at the wicked. Who are the wicked? Who are the godly? When the psalm talks about evildoers, who does it mean? When it talks about workers of iniquity, who does David have in mind? When David speaks about the upright and the righteous, precisely who is he talking about? Let the psalm speak for itself. Look at verse 12. The wicked plotteth against the just and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. When this psalm talks about the wicked, it is talking about those who have malicious thoughts against the Lord's people. They have malicious intentions against Christian people. They sometimes speak malicious words against them. Yet they're the very people who often prosper. Look at verse 14. These people are often, and usually, the very people who spend their life trying to bring others down. Especially people in need. Especially those who are trying to live honestly in this life. They're trying to bring them down. Look at verse 21. These are the people whose honesty is not total. Their honourableness is not complete. They'll borrow a thing and won't give it back. And have no conscience about it. Look at verse 32. These people are anti the righteous. Yet they're the very people who prosper. That's the cause of the psalmist's problem. Who does David mean when he speaks about the upright and the godly and the righteous? Now look at verse 21. The righteous showeth mercy and giveth. Look at verse 26. He is ever merciful and lendeth, and his seed is blessed. Here are people who seek to live genuinely for the welfare and good of other people. Look at verse 30. Here are people who don't get all entangled with trivia. But their lips speak wisdom and they especially speak of justice. They're concerned about what is good and right. But look specially at verse 31. They are the way they are because the law of their God is in their hearts. That's who the upright are as David surveys the world. Now, read this psalm as many times as you like, and you'll find that there are only two sorts of people in the psalm. There are only workers of iniquity, or the upright. There are only the evildoers, or the righteous. There are only those who laugh at the righteous, or those who have God's word in their hearts, and who trust in the Lord, verse 40. Our Lord's teaching, of course, is exactly the same in this world where you live. God doesn't divide the world into Catholics and Protestants. God doesn't divide the world into pagans and others. God doesn't divide the world that way. God divides the world quite clearly into two roads. There's a wide road and a narrow one. Two masters. They are only the devil and the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Two sorts of characters self-centered, and those in which the fruit of the Spirit are found. Two destinies, they are hell and heaven. The world in which we live is only divided into two. There's no middle ground. It's a clear division. And therefore, some of you have a problem immediately. You say, well, Pastor, when, when you describe the wicked, I didn't fit obviously into that category. And yet when you describe the righteous, I can't say that I fitted obviously into that category either. Well, it's time to stop and look at the psalm a little harder, my friend. 
Because there are only two categories. You are either one who in the final analysis laughs at the things of God or one who in the final analysis has the law of your God in your heart. But I don't laugh at Christians. But when you find that they live their unselfish lives, not because unselfishness is just a good thing in and of itself, but they live their unselfish lives because they love him, some of you think, they're they're pushing it a bit far. And when you hear them say that honesty extends even down to returning borrowed property, honesty extends even to paying the correct fare on the bus, Honesty extends even to being at work on time. Honesty extends even to not making cassette recordings of your friends' records. Then you say they're bordering on the fanatical. And although your acts may not be the same as other people's acts, your basic attitudes are the same as theirs. Although you may not have engaged in the violence and the malice of others, In your heart of hearts, you are still the same as they are. Your root philosophy is me first. The lines are quite clearly drawn in the word of God. The righteous are those, as we read here, who order their lives, verse 31, because they have a God whose law they know, and that that law of God they hide in their hearts. And the law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. The wicked are those who order their lives by anything else except God's word. The righteous are those who order their lives by God's word. That's how the wicked and the godly are distinguished. And the temptation which we face is that those of us who seek to live according to God's law we're often tempted to look over our shoulders, and we shouldn't, at those who order their lives by some other principles. And we're tempted to get stomach cramp and headaches and concern and to lose sleep over the fact that they prosper in this world and we don't appear to. And it's that temptation which this psalm is dealing with. Well, let's move on to our third point. We found out what the temptation is. We found out how to distinguish the ungodly from the godly. Now we find out from the psalm why it is that the godly should not envy the wicked. Why shouldn't you be jealous of the man who got the job you wanted? Why shouldn't you be jealous of that ungodly woman who has what you wanted to have? Why shouldn't you be uptight at the fact that in your few years on earth, they have a better deal, it seems, than you do? The psalm gives us the answer. Look at verse 1 and 2. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Ladies and gentlemen, the wicked won't be here much longer. Look at verse 9. Evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be, yea? Thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be! Don't envy the wicked. The wicked won't be here much longer. Verse 20, the wicked shall perish and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume, into smoke shall they consume away. The wicked won't be here much longer. Look at verse 35, I've seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a green bay tree. Yet he passed away and lo he was not. Yea, I sought him but he could not be found. Some of the wicked who you thought would be here for a long time have already gone. And the wicked, all of the wicked, won't be here much longer. Look at verse 38. The transgressors shall be destroyed together. The end of the wicked shall be cut off. The wicked won't be here much 
longer. Sometimes God removes a wicked man at the very height of his influence. So Herod stands up and he's speaking away and everybody says, he speaks like a god, he speaks like a god. He puts his hands behind his lapels and says to himself, I have done rather well, haven't I? And doesn't give glory to God. The angel of God strikes him in that moment. And he's removed at the very height of his influence. But whether the wicked are removed suddenly or not, they won't be here much longer. Scripture promises a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. And you'll be able to pace, my Christian friend, from one end of the new heaven to the other. You'll be able to pace the circumference of the new earth, if it has a circumference, and you'll find no wickedness, no sin, no death, no tears, no curse, no sea. For all the former things will have passed away. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. But the godly will always be here. Even in this life, whatever the wicked do to the godly, the godly will always be here. It doesn't matter what new theology will come running from some part of the world tomorrow, It doesn't matter what new books or new scientific discoveries are found. It doesn't matter what totalitarian governments come into power. It doesn't matter what influences are let loose in the world. The godly will always be here. Look at verse 12. The wicked plotteth against the just and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. The Lord shall laugh at him, for he seeth that his day is coming. The wicked have drawn out the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy and to slay such as be of upright conversation. Their sword shall enter into their own heart and their bows shall be broken. There's no ultimate success for them. Look at verse 17. The arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholdeth the righteous. Look at verse 18. I beg your pardon, verse 28. The Lord loveth judgment and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever. For the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. Look at verse 32. The wicked watcheth the righteous and seeketh to slay him. The Lord will not leave him in his hand, nor condemn him when he is judged. Go to verse 38. The transgressors shall be destroyed together, the end of the wicked shall be cut off, but the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble, and the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them, because they trust in him. It's quite clear we don't have an impartial God in that sense. God is on the side of certain people. He's on the side of those who have his law in their hearts. He's on the side of those who trust him. He's on the side of those who order their lives according to his will. And they'll always be here. And God will care for them in this life and embrace them in the next. Let the psalm speak again. Verse 11. The meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. At that resurrection day when you wake up and your body is like Christ's glorious body, body and soul are reunited and you breathe that air, if there is air, and it's heavenly air, you'll walk about and find no persecutors, no sin, nothing to trouble or disturb the perfect godliness and bliss of the new heaven and the new earth. Heaven will be wonderful. One of the wonderful things about heaven will be that we won't carry any keys in our pockets. I now have four bunches of keys, a daily reminder of the sinfulness of this world. There will be no locks on our doors, no worrying when your daughter's in late, no concern that the people you work with, because you will work in heaven, will will be antagonistic or sarcastic or cynical or will ostracize you. All the folk with whom you company will give you perfect, uninhibited fellowship and the Lamb will be the light of the place and we shall enjoy the unveiled splendor of his presence, each one of us, throughout endless ages. 
The godly will always be here. Look at verse 16. A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholdeth the righteous. 18. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. Even in this life we are enjoying the care of God. Verse 22. For such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth, and they that be cursed of him shall be cut off. True, we're going to fall, verse 23 and 4, but God never forsakes us, nor does he ever leave us, 25, begging for bread. Look at verse 28, he preserves us forever. Verse 29, we inherit the land and dwell therein forever. Verse 37, the end of a righteous man is peace. Now, friends, If you look at things as they are, you're going to be unutterably depressed. Things as they are, are like this. The ungodly prosper, the righteous are discriminated against. Everything's going well for them. Things don't seem to be going at all well for the Lord's people. But we don't live by sight, nor do we walk by sight. Faith is the order of the day for the Lord's people. We take God of his word, we have the conviction of things hoped for, and the, the substance and conviction of things unseen. We don't look at things as they are, we look at things as they will be. We know what things will be, because God's word has announced it. And we look forward in faith to the day, when no wickedness can even be found. And there will be nothing but righteousness, and Christ-likeness, and godliness, and bliss. Well, we close by looking at how the godly should behave. We've seen what the problem is. We've seen how to distinguish the wicked from the godly. We've seen why we shouldn't envy the wicked. In fact, if you think about it, the wicked are to be pitied. That's why you must announce the gospel to them. They're to be pitied. They think that this prosperity is all that matters And yet they're running headlong into the arms of an angry God to take the gospel to them. But how should the godly behave? It's not enough to say, fret not. It's not enough just to point to the future. Tomorrow you've still got to go to work. You've still got to live amongst the ungodly. You've still got to witness them prospering. You've still got to open the paper and see who is getting influence and power, and long and still long for years yet, that it, which things should be different. So how are you going to have to behave? Look at verse 3. 10,000, I'm tempted to say 10 million sermons, must have been preached on the verses I'm about to read. Start at verse 3. Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass, and he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Verse 27, depart from evil and do good, and dwell forevermore. Verse 34, wait on the Lord, and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. Well, sermon after sermon, I say, has been preached on that. Those sermons have six points. Trust, delight, commit, rest, depart, wait. A six-point sermon is a very dangerous thing to preach because you can't remember six points, most of us. Two is enough and three is about the maximum. You You can get those six great words together 
and you can put them into your two hands and reduce them to two points. You put those verses together and you can say this, be decided about your godliness. Cultivate communion with God. Seeing that the wicked are going to be going to perish, seeing that nothing awaits us except everlasting bliss, seeing that God's never forsaken us, you don't ever have to be ashamed not to belong to that crowd. Therefore, be decidedly open about the fact that you are on the Lord's side. Is it clear at school that you're there and not there? Do they know in the office that you don't belong to that crowd, but this one? Are you known as someone who doesn't order his life according to me first, but the law of your God is in your heart? Look at verse 27. Depart from evil and do good. Verse 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. Verse 34. Wait on the Lord and keep his way. Be decided about it. Stand out for God. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Unashamedly finished with ungodly perspectives. Clearly and obviously on the Lord's side. Push down your beating pulse. Grasp your courage. Be known as his. That's the way we have to behave. But not just being known as his. The second point is cultivate communion with this God. Look at verse 4. It's a wonderful verse, verse 4. You've switched off for most of the sermon, have you? We're coming up to the hour when we stop. Listen to verse 4. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. If you fill your vision with Christ, you will have whatever you want. Now, of course, what you want now, at a time of poor communion with God, and what you want then, when your heart is ravished with Christ, won't necessarily be the same. So don't say, I'm going to get communion with God just so I can have that particular thing that I want. Because if you have genuine communion with God, a lot of things that you now want, you won't want. And a lot of things you don't want, now you will want. But when you delight yourself with the Lord, he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Cultivate communion with God. All discontent is the fruit of a poor communion with God. All dissatisfaction is the result of poor communion with God. All disrest all frustration, all impatience. It's all the result of poor fellowship with heaven. So delight yourself in the Lord and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. And when you're truly delighted in him, you'll never want to look over your shoulders again at how they're getting on. Let him order your affairs. Look at verse 5. Put yourself in his hands. Stop looking over the shoulder at what the Jones want for you. Apologies to any Jones present. Stop plotting to have what the unconverted have. Commit your way to the Lord. Let him decide it for you. Go home and take out your hymn book and sing 404, which we're not going to sing now. It's a wonderful hymn by Bonner. His way is the best way. We're not in heaven yet, Pastor. No, that's why verse seven's there. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Commit your way to the Lord, verse five. Verse six, he shall bring forth at last, he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light and thy judgment as the noonday. Within a very few years, we who believe will be in heaven. And who knows, it may be a few months only, or a few weeks, or a few hours for some, or all. We don't know. How glad we will be in heaven that we didn't walk the way of the wicked. 
So why fret about it now? When I am dying, how glad I shall be that the lamp of my life has been blazed out for thee. I shall be glad in whatever I gave, labour or money, one sinner to save. I shall not mind that the path has been rough, that thy dear feet led the way is enough. When I am dying, how glad I shall be that the lamp of my life has been blazed out for thee.